Good morning, church. Thank you for coming over this morning. It's always a blessing to see each and every one of you every first day of the week to worship together, to sing praises, and uh, to see each other and to in encourage one another as we worship our true and loving God. Um, I'm here again in your presence this morning to, to bring the message from God. And um, um, I'd like you to bear with me. There's a lot of things that um, are in this uh, book that we're going to study this morning. But I know that with God's mercy and grace, we will go through it. Um, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Father and our God, we come to you this morning with a humble heart and we would like to show you how we love you and how we really worship you in our heart and in our mind. At this time, dear God, um, please use your servant to deliver the message that you want your children to hear. And I pray, dear God, that you make your servant less and less and more and more of you so that they could, they could hear your voice and listen to you. And to me, dear God, because I'm not worthy to deliver your message, but with your grace and mercy, we will hear you. Thank you, Father God, for all of these blessings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning, thank you very much, Brother Pete, for the prepared songs for this morning. Uh, really appreciate the songs that uh, connects and uh, say the message. Actually, the last song that we sung, the make uh, my make me a servant it says the things that I, we are going to talk this morning talk about this morning anyway uh also to brother carlos uh to brother jo carlos for the um for the um scripture reading thank you so in our slide it says heart of a servant says, give me a heart of a servant, O Lord, tender and faithful and true. Fill me with love, then use me, O Lord, so that the world can see you. We will be looking on the book of Genesis chapter 24. If you have your Bible with you, please, if you would join me in reading some of the verses here as we go along. And I'll read it again. It says, The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house, from the land of my family and my birth, who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants, I will give you this land. He will send his angels before you, and you will take a wife from there for my son. Genesis 24, verse 7. In this narrative, Genesis 24, Abraham is about 140 years old, and Sarah, his wife, is already passed. It is time for Isaac, which is, who is now 40 years of age, to have a wife and a family of his own. For it was promised to Abraham that his descendants will be as many as the stars in heaven. And during this time, finding a wife for your children is being arranged by parents. Here, Abraham is, will be delegating this very important task that will be the future 
of what God has promised him. He is sending out his trusted chief servant for this very important mission to find a wife for Isaac. I mentioned that at this time, parents arrange this thing for their children. It is called arranged marriage in our time. A marriage planned and agreed by the families or the guardians of the bride and the groom. We will see that it is biblical. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, it says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? You know, parents choose the mate for their children because they know they have the wisdom that they could partner their children or their child to the one that would be beneficial for everybody for their soul and for their well-being we will see also that it is practical it is a farming principle like joining two animals in a yoke with the same kind the same height and strength flowing in one direction. In the USA, in the US today, Chicago Tribune wrote a surprising new look that arranged marriages in the United States lead to love, satisfaction, and commitment. Well, in the presence of our young people here right now, when you think that it's time for you to settle down, dad and mom's approval is still a gem. But we're not here this morning to talk about arranged marriage, though there's an important principle around it. Now, let's go back to Abraham. He's delegating his chief servant to find a wife or his son. He knows and believes that God will find a way so that it could happen. His faith in God is solid rock. His faith in God is solid. Let's read Genesis 24, verse 1 to 4. Abraham was now very old, and the Lord has blessed him in every way. He said to the chief servant in his household, the one in charge of all he had, put your hand under my thigh, and I want you to swear by God, the Lord of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives to get a wife for my son Isaac. Now, Abraham was a successful entrepreneur. He is a respected businessman in his community, mostly probably livestock and, like, and some businesses, probably because he is rich, he is blessed by God. This is a promise that God has said to him. Genesis, going back to Genesis 12, verse 2, God said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Abraham here is delegating a very important task to his trusted servant. He commissioned him. We will be looking on at servanthood, a faithfulness, humbleness, and commitment. Servanthood means the state of being a servant, one in a position of subjection, a slave, or a bondsman 
one purchase of money who was compelled to serve as subject to the king. Now, sending the servant, Abraham some, have some criteria for his future daughter-in-law. They said, young people, this is the thing that uh, I was telling you about how parents knew. She should be, uh, one of his uh, criteria is, the woman should be from Abraham's hometown. Abraham's nation, is, which is Mesopotam Mesopotamia, or city of Or, the ancient Sumer, uh, they called Sumerians, who live in the southern part, which is now Iraq. The heartland of summer lay between the Euphrates and the Tigris River in, in what the Greeks later called Mesopotamia. So, in the Bible it says, but you will not you will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son, Isaac. Number two criteria, she should be from his bloodline, should be a relative. Genesis 24, 24 said, she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel and the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. Nahor is... Um, a relative of Abraham. Number three, the woman should be willing to go. Genesis 24, 8, it says, But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. And Isaac shouldn't be going there with him. The woman should be there with him, should be going with him to bring to Isaac. Just uh, a vision of uh, the location of their, of their um, journey. So they were now in Canaan and they're going to on the other side of Mesopotamia. It is like uh, 400 400 to 450 miles journey. So, now, how will the servant do it? How will he know? How's it gonna happen? Abraham said in verse 7 The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house from the land of my family and my birth, who spoke to me and swore to me, saying to your descendants, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife from there for my son. That's faith. What is faith? Faith, in Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of the things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. Substance is the body, solidity, and the reality of the things hoped for. While evidence is the proof and the confirmation and the affirmation of things that are not seen. The servant here should have the same faith as his master because looking back on his master's credentials, Looking back on Abraham's faithfulness credentials, he was called by God to leave his father's household to a land that he didn't know. He's looking for a place where the maker and the builder is God because God promised him. God promised him that he will be the father of many nations that will be given that he is already, but with a given that he is already old and Sarah too, but then it happened, he passed the test of faith when God asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac as a burnt offering. Abraham trust, entrusted it all to the Lord. He knows that it will be a success because God will take over. What a faith. Question, how about you? 
And it's a question for me too. How's your faith? How's my faith? How's our faith? Is your faith strong and unshakable? How deep are the roots of your faith? How many times you have proved the faithfulness of God to you and to His children? The other day, I texted Miss Pat and just, you know, trying to encourage her, but as I've said before, our brothers and sisters, sometimes when you call them to encourage them, you'll be the one who is going to be encouraged. I want to show you the things that uh, she texted me. She said, yes, we are living in a times like no other. Hold on to your faith. Keep encouraging others to keep the faith and to look for Christ's return. There are so many struggling to hold on to their faith, battling depression, separated from one another. Fear is at all time high, etc., etc. But we know that God is still on his throne. Do not lose heart, brother, she said to me. Thank you, Ms. Black. Mark 11, 22, 24 said, Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whenever you ask for in the prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Without faith, you won't receive favors from God. Without faith, you cannot please God. Without faith, you cannot make God smile. Now, looking at this unnamed servant in this story, he is most, he is most likely Abram's chief servant, Eleazar of Damascus. His name was mentioned earlier in the previous chapter on Genesis chapter 15, verse 12. Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? He said. So the servant's name is Eleazar. Eliezer. Eliezer. Eliezer is Abram's ship servant, and his name means a helper or a comforter. Helper or comforter. Ring a bell? It's like the Holy Spirit, right? Anyway, okay. We will see here that Eliezer, the ship servant, is an obedient, it's not just an obedient servant. He is also a prayer for man. He prayed for signs that God will direct him to the right person. And this is faith in action. He prayed signs and hoped that God will do his part. Genesis 24. Sorry, that's 24 verse 12 and 15. And then he prayed. Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this stream and the daughters of my townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Then her be the one you have chosen for my servant Isaac. By this I know that you have shown kindness to my master. And do you know that he is also a righteous man? Why do we know that? Because his righteousness was shown when his prayer was immediately answered. Look at on verse 15. Before he is even finished praying, Rebekah, 
the one that has been chosen came out with her jar on her shoulder and she was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milka, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. Everything came to a place, came to its proper places right away. So we could say that this servant, Eliezer, is not just a prayerful and obedient, he's also a righteous person. Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. And James 15, 16 and 18, The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crop. With Abraham's strong faith in God and his servant believing and having the same faith, his mission is clearly taking place. We will also see that God's work is above and beyond. Look at it. Abraham did not mention about the physical attributes of the woman to be found. But God provided it more than what was expected. Genesis 24, 16 says, The woman, which is Rebecca, was very beautiful, a virgin. No man has ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. So God provided the physical attributes without even asking them, without even Abraham asking. But he, God, took care of them every minute detail now look at humbleness the servant Eliezer acknowledged that it was God's kindness and faithfulness for everything was taking place as his master hoped not by his own doing but God leading him to his mission and to his journey Genesis 24, 26, 27 says, When the man, the servant, bowed down and worshipped the Lord, then the man, the servant, bowed down and worshipped the Lord, saying, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on a journey to the house of my master's relatives. He was a humble servant. He always repaired to his masters, never mentioning anything about himself. He didn't even mention his name, just Abraham's servant, he said. He learned and emulate, emanate the humbleness of his master. Proverbs 22, 4. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. As a servant of Jesus Christ, we should imitate his humility. Philippians 2, 5 and 8, 5 to 8 said, Have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bond servant and being born in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Commitment. Dedication, devotion, and allegiance, loyalty, faithfulness. The journey in this mission is around 450 miles one way. So about 900 miles round trip. This is not an easy task. The servant is seriously accomplishing his mission according to the instruction of his master. 
He made clear His purpose and what has transpired word by word on behalf of His Master Abraham and made sure that everybody will agree. For He brought gifts and valuables to seal the agreement. It should be, is it going to be a deal or no deal? Is she coming or not? Genesis 24, 49. It says, So now, if you are going to deal kindly and truthfully with my master, again, he's referring to his master, not to him. Tell me. And if not, tell me now. So that I may turn to the right or to the left. Tell me now so that I could go. He is really serious on his commitment. In fact, so committed that he dealt with his master's business without delay. Look, 24, look at Genesis 24, 56. 54 to 56 says, Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. When they got up in the morning, he said, Send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, let the young woman stay with us in a few days, say 10. Afterwards, she may go. However, he said to them, Do not delay me. Since the Lord has prospered my way, send me away so that I may go to my master. The servant wants to please his master right away. A successful mission that would make his master happy and accomplished. Because God is in control, the mission of Eliezer was a success. Just how Abraham pictured it. How's our commitment to God? How's our commitment to our family? How's our commitment to our church? How do we serve them? How do we give our best to God in our service? Do we give our best to God in our service? Are we faithfully committed to our family and to each of our church family? How about your commitment, your earthly master, your daily job? Second Timothy, as a servant, Second Timothy 2.15, do your best. To present yourself to God as one approved, as a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. As a faithful servant, we should always be conscious on how we conduct ourselves. We are representing our master, Jesus Christ, and to his character we should emulate so that others may see God's beauty in us. You know, there are still many people in our society who do not read the Bible. But let me remind you again that these people can read us. If we claim to be servants of God, then let us act as one. Do we still cling to the other idols as we serve Him? Or do we or are we fully committed to Him? Do we still keep something for ourselves just in case? Or do we really entrust everything to Him? Bible says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other. Or you will be devoted or committed to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Another one, Proverbs 16.3. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. If a man bows a bow to the Lord, or swear a note to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Omit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Our perspective, serving is the only way you can follow a servant. 
There is simply no other means of following Jesus than learning to put others ahead of yourself and give your best to their needs. We know that it demands humility, love, genuine heart to see others grow. Jesus said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. Mark 9, 35. John 13, before I go there, we are servants of Jesus Christ because we are purchased not by money, but by His blood and by His life. And we are here to love God first, all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And likewise, our love to all fellow servants and fellow men. Our first training of servanthood begins at home. It is the closest I can define on how to be a servant. Being a parent requires a lot of responsibilities and sacrifices in order to bring up our children physically, morally, and spiritually sound. We care for them because we love them. We serve them because we love them. We make sacrifices for them because we love them. Until the time for them to serve on their own. If we model it right, then we're raising them right. Because Jesus has showed us in John 13, 14, 17. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, said, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, or his, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Servant of God should always take care of each other in order to have harmony in serving together. We should refrain from thinking too much of ourselves. We are one body with different parts. If a fellow servant is not well, we should all be there to support him, encourage him, and restore him. Or it will affect the whole body if we don't do something about it. Right in our congregation at this moment, I have a couple of good servants who are in a situation where because of the frailty of the physical body are sick. But we know that they serve with all their heart, with all their strength. We know them. And we're so blessed in this church that we have a lot of members and a lot of brothers and sisters who got a humble heart, who got a heart of a servant. So blessed. Philippians 2, 3, 4 says, Philippians 2, verses 3 to 4 says, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Together, we are strong. Thinking about what is good and beneficial to others should be our attitude. Asking wisdom from God, courage, selflessness, humility, and common sense, and also forgiveness. We are not perfect and we will make mistakes. Mistakes that will sometimes offend others, especially our co-servant. You who are strong should understand and encourage those who are weak. Be humble to accept your faults and amend right away. For with that, 
the love and harmony in the body will continue to be healthy in all aspects. Spirit, spiritually strong, morally upright, physically strong, and united. It is just, just because you preach. It is not because you are an elder. It is not because that you are a deacon, that you are a servant. No, everybody is a servant. Everybody. We were all purchased by Jesus' blood so that we are all subject to him. And it is not because we serve at the worship every Sunday. What matters most is the condition of the heart. The condition of the heart when we pray, our condition when we sing, the condition of our heart when we give our offering, the condition of our heart when we do the communion. For those who preach the gospel and for those who have ears to listen, how's the condition of your heart? We should learn the heart of a servant. We should serve our master, our king, our savior in true faith, total humility, and total commitment. At the time when we accepted Christ and got baptized in his fellowship, we were committed. It is no longer I who live, but Christ liveth in me should always be in our mindset. Once again, the prayer servant, prays the servant's prayer says, Lord, please give me a heart of a servant, tender and faithful and true. Fill me with love, then use me, O Lord, so that the world can see you. You are here today and need to be in fellowship with Jesus. Believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Repent from your sins and be baptized. The water is prepared. If you decide now, we can assist you and we will continue to study with you. And nourish you with God's word and how to live a life according to God's plan and purpose. Being a servant is putting God first. He is our priority and how to please him. If you are here this morning, need to be reconciled because you wandered off. Come so that we can pray together and God will restore you. New slate, new hope. A new life. Thank you again for this opportunity this morning. The lesson is yours. And to God be the glory as we stand and sing our song of invitation. <laughs>